I'm privileged to now introduce the keynote speaker for the 2022 Sustainability Summit, Dr. Serenity Wright. Uh, I knew I'd do this. Who is the Associate Director for Social Innovation at the University of Kentucky? Dr. Wright earned her doctorate from the University of Kentucky in policy, measurement, and evaluation, and her research interests include equity and access to opportunities. This is something she is passionate about, including advocating for those who struggle to access opportunities. Today, she develops and manages new innovation and entrepreneurship programs focused on inclusive innovation and creating equitable access to entrepreneurship and innovation training for underrepresented innovators at UK and in Kentucky. We're excited to have Dr. Wright here today to speak with us. At this time, please give Dr. Wright a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everybody for having me. I know my title is a mouthful and I, I apologize for that. We could have just led with, I am the flipped stool, right? That Shane was talking about earlier. Um, that is my job, that is what I do. Um, so thank you all for having me here today. Thank you to Amy for asking me to be part of this conversation. Thank you to our sponsors. And again, I think what we've gained from this morning so far is the critical element that this is just the beginning, right? Nobody can solve these problems, answer the questions, provide you with all the resources, data, and opportunities in 10 minutes or less, right? So I really do hope that today is a start for you. Um, the element that I love most about Bluegrass Green Source is their tagline, um, small changes, big impact. Because sometimes I think even in this morning, where we got to was a place of paralysis by analysis. Right? But what do we do? Where do we go? How do we fix it? How do we change it? There's so much that has to be done. So we don't need to get caught up overthinking. We just need to focus. Instead of doing nothing, how can we find the small changes for big impacts? And that's what I'm hoping to talk to you about today. So today, you will leave this session inspired and empowered. Inspiration gives us the energy that we need to do the hard work. Empowerment gives us the tools that we need to do the hard work. Now, if you know me, I'm mostly cynical and sarcastic, so I'm about 50-50 on the inspiration piece, but I'm confident you'll leave here with the tools for, to, with the tools for today um, that are gonna help us build more sustainable communities. All right, where'd the clicker go? See, this is what happens when you're in an event and you don't wanna do what everybody else is doing. Also, I'm 5'1". If I stand back here, you can't see me. John, what do I do? What do I click? Green button. Green button. Thanks, team. Appreciate that. Um, so what is at the intersection? At the intersection of environmental equity and land use is us. Every one of us in this room plays a critical role in the sustainability of our environment and in our communities. And these photos are intentional because I'm going to talk about these companies today. I'm going to talk about land use today. And I'm standing on my parents' farm. We've grown crops for years here in Kentucky. And we are a federally protected land, so it can't be developed. Um, so there are options that people can seek uh, depending on how your land is being used. But we are at the intersection of environmental equity and justice and land use. Because we, everyone in this room, has the ability to affect change, to be a change agent in this time and space. You could be a policymaker, advocate, a passionate plant parent, which I am. Don't leave your table with a sapling. Don't look in my bag if it's gone or a buyer and purchaser of change. Or maybe you are all of these things. But we make decisions that drive policies, procedures, access, and opportunity. We determine, all of us in this room, have an opportunity to determine if and how we are building sustainable communities. We do this in our professional spaces, in the policies that we have in place. We do it in our communities with the enterprises that we choose to support, and we do it in our relationship with the ways in which we choose to interact and elevate others. Today is about how we adjust, address, and change systems that do not allow for access because of a lack of equity. Availability and accessibility are not the same. Just because a resource is available does not mean it's accessible to everyone, and we've heard that over and over this morning. Our speakers this morning have already showed us how environmental equity shows up in many different ways. 
Ashley Smith is a dear friend of mine, and she's the founder and CEO of Black Soil. And the research question that she continues to push that drives her business is if Mother Nature can't see who puts seeds in the ground, then why are there such disparities in agriculture? From the inability to access clean water to how our environment enhances our social issues, our individual backgrounds allow us to internalize every experience differently. I grew up in a poor and developing nation, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, but it eats through me, and my sister's in this room, so this will actually probably be triggering for her as well. Every time someone in my family leaves a light on, an external door open, she's probably over there sweating because we can already hear our dad screaming at us about these things, stands in the refrigerator for too long with the door open. I see these things, I was raised to understand these things as a sense of entitlement, a lack of awareness about resources and the privilege it is to have these as resources. A lack of awareness about bills, a passive aggressive dig about how much it costs to pay said bills, to afford the privilege, to have access to this resource. But maybe you leave your doors open all the time for fresh air, and that's fine. It's a different perspective. Maybe you don't have access to central heat and air, so you can't even begin to understand the privilege. That's okay, it's a different perspective. But the question is, do you respond to these things as entitlement, purpose, or privilege? Today I hope to shift how we think about and react to conversations, initiatives, policy changes, and issues regarding access and opportunities. We know there are areas where communities are disproportionately served. We know that. Evaluating our policies and processes should be a continuous and iterative process that engages with the community. As conversations related to access and opportunities have become more common and overt over the last several years, it has taken on its own social identification. The shared expectation is that conversations related to expanding access and opportunity, specifically through a lens of equity, inclusion, justice, are typically grounded in race, socioeconomic status, gender, sexuality, et cetera. But diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, accessibility is also about food, natural resources, jobs, community activities, youth sports, permits, bills, educational access. And huh, there's definitely an and, because there are so many things that I haven't even mentioned. The and is on how all of these elements overlap, intersect, and collide, and the impacts and outcomes of those things. So I hope you are hearing today the conversations, meaning that you are making, meaning you respect and make space for the thoughts, opinions, data of those that are being shared with you today. Maybe there have been, and there have been, we can't deny it, topics that make us uncomfortable. And I hope there continues to be topics that make us uncomfortable as the day goes. I hope you follow up on those areas for more understanding, more support, more engagement. Only in continuing to learn together can we work together to create communities where every member feels they can access the basics that they need to do more than just survive. They can provide for their families, their employees. They can thrive as engaged members of sustainable communities. How are we understanding and thinking about the changes that need to happen? Colin Powell said, a dream doesn't become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work. Now, if you can do a magic trick, my team knows this, like this is how I get kidnapped, y'all. Like, I don't have FOMO, I have JOMO, the joy of missing out, I'm perfectly fine staying at home. But if you have a magic trick, I'm showing up, I'm getting in the van, and I'm bringing snacks. So, but magic takes sweat, determination, and hard work. I'm committed to helping you through the sweat and to do the hard work, but today's just a brisk walk, right? Again, this is the start to a conversation. We're just getting warmed up. But the hope is that it gets your heart rate up a little bit, gets you energized, empowered, to get up and do it again tomorrow. Do it better, do it more deeply. It being more learning, more growing, more talking, more of the good stuff, more listening. So today I wanna to talk you through three things. Lenses, thinking caps, and action items. It's these things that we bring together in order to create the magic. 
So let's talk about our lenses that we're all currently wearing. Well, did you know you have sunglasses on right now? I can see them. Touch your face. Do you see them? I see them. No? Okay. Not everybody's ready? I'll show you mine. I'll do it first. Because sometimes when you look silly, you got to do it first. So it's fine. I'll do it. I was raised in a village in Indonesia. We were poor. Like we had one hot plate to cook with. No shower. I grew up clean water, insecure. And we had to boil the bugs out of our food before we can eat it. That type of poor. I was baptized Catholic at birth, raised Buddhist in a Muslim country, and I attend a Christian church. I got questions about religion, but that's not today. I was a competitive athlete and competed internationally. Competition, team, drive are true strengths and areas of growth for me, depending on how I'm exerting these characteristics. Just ask my team. They're back there. Twice in my life, I've been enrolled in a school where I didn't understand how to learn, didn't speak the language, and didn't understand the grading system. Do you see what I'm doing? Do you see where I'm going? Each of these lenses, and specifically shaded lenses, impacts how I engage with you. It also deeply impacts how you engage with me. So we are all wearing glasses of our own. Constantly questioning these lenses that I have, that you have, that we have, is what helps us do the sweaty work to affect change. Empathy is learning how to share these lenses with someone else. You can borrow mine. I can help you understand what it was like to be poor. I can help show you what it's like to walk in my shoes as a five foot one biracial female. Do you know how many emails were exchanged to figure out a plan because I can't see? You can't see me over that? I can share my lenses with you, but you can't have my lenses, right? You have your own. Empathy is about being able to share, being able to see, being able to recognize that I have them. And when you borrow, when we share, it helps us see a form, a policy, a process differently. It helps us understand, to Shane's point this morning, who is being screwed the most, right? And this ridiculous visual is intentional for numerous reasons. These sunglasses represent our phenomenology, how we know what we know, how we understand what we know. And the intent is to demonstrate that at no point can we see through all of our lenses at the same time. At any given moment, one of those is projecting more than the other. We manage all of our interactions through all of these lenses, and that is what has shaped who we are as individuals. Lens switching is what makes us unique. The lens in which we are looking through and therefore interacting with the world constantly changes. I intentionally chose sunglasses to represent this point about perspective and how we operate within a community of any size because it visually helps you understand the complexities of all of the ways the elements in your background can and do intersect and impact how you engage with the world. But they are also tinted. I'm not using clear glasses. I'm using sunglasses. These are devices that help protect our eyes from bright light, from something that could cause harm. It has a film so things aren't crisp or clear. And in this same way, when we are not aware of the lens in which we are viewing a policy or process or conversation with a friend, we are guarding ourselves from all of the elements that are contributing to that situation. We have applied our own tint. I want you to start reflecting on all of the lenses that you have. Are you a veteran, multilingual, the type of family you grew up in? Where did you grow up? Urban, suburban, the type of home, large or small community? Did you work growing up? Do you have different physical abilities, different learning abilities? Did you have to take care of siblings so you couldn't work, or other children in your home, or a parent, or a grandparent? Do you have debt? Do you own a car? Do you rent? Do you own? Medical condition? Do you require special foods or special medicines? Can your community access those things. I can go on and on, but I would encourage you to truly make a list of these today, especially in the time between our afternoon session. You may hear the information differently. Maybe you frame your question differently. But being acutely and overtly aware of them will help you internalize and conceptualize the information that you have received during the summit, and then how to apply it to your workspace, community, or organization. Now, I also want us to talk about thinking caps in that next block. So policymakers, changers, and policy advocates. No surprise, that means it's all of you, because we can all be an advocate, even if we can't change a policy. 
or make a policy. I need you to put your thinking caps on. Thinking caps are about teaching ourselves to think differently. You can't just do that, right? If somebody says, well, just think about it differently, it doesn't just happen, right? You have to train your brain to ask different questions. So as an example, as we've talked about how are we engaging with our communities, how are we asking those questions, how are we providing feedback loops? Is it for people who work second and third shifts? Maybe I don't have a laptop or iPad. Maybe it's in a form and I need to be able to write. Maybe I don't have access to technology. How do I get that mailed into me? Now I'm out of hats because my head is small and that gets real ridiculous real fast, but stay with me, okay? Is it accessible in my dominant language? You don't have to remove every hurdle, but are you working towards an option to support and encourage people around every hurdle? Again, today is about moving from conversation to action items, and we acknowledge when we acknowledge a gap in our community, it's what we do with this information. How do we move forward? How do we make our communities better? How do we support each other? And one simple and easy step is to make a list of your own lenses. You have to reflect on your own identity, your own thinking caps, before you can be focused on and support the various identities of someone else. So think about the resources you need to support the different elements of who you are. Go to the public library and try and access a website for a permit. Go stand in line in a public service office. Can you read all the signs? Can you hear and understand all the employees? Can you find support for foods for medical or cultural or personal needs? Can you find a medical practitioner in your community that meets your physical, mental, and emotional needs? Can you find services to support a child with different learning abilities or an aging adult who needs special services? Does everyone have options? And that's options with an S. It should be plural. Now we have an action item to either make a change or advocate for a change. And if that's not your jam, like if you're not ready for that, if, if we're at baby steps and entering into this space, help someone. Oh, you'll figure it out. Not helpful. Help someone. Emotions, frustrations become heightened when we lose sight of the individual, when we lose sight of the humanity that is at the core of change and are only focused on the overwhelming amount of change. So build out the logic model. I'm not kidding, write it out, right? You can do this for your company, you can do it for your friends, but write it out so you can think about it. Take the emotions out of it. Be clear about what you want them to know and understand and be able to do. So back to the beginning, small changes for big impacts. If you just need small ways to make a difference for you or to share with somebody else, know better, do better. And let's talk about how we can all participate and encourage expanding awareness and education around environmental justice and equity and land use. The easiest point of entry for small change with big impacts is how we spend our money, right? Back to Shane's stool. Economic impact is one of those pillars. With this being graduation and outdoor um, party season, Buying power is huge right now. So I'm gonna highlight a couple of companies today that are places that I buy from and choose to support specifically because of their social entrepreneurship focus, specifically in environmental equity and land use. All of them are grounded in sustainable practices that support environmental equity and land use. These are my personal preferences and my own personal choices. And this list is also not exhaustive, right? So get your phones out and open your camera app because they all come with a QR code and I want you to learn about it later. Yeah, I'm like, get your phones out, open your camera so you can scan the QR code. I'm gonna move through these fairly quickly so we can get to questions. And if you do your questions right, top question wins a prize from one of these companies. There's three prizes you can win. Um, but again, QR codes for you to learn a little bit later. Nope, wrong button. All right, so Jane Mossbacher Morris, if you want to understand how you can participate better in this, she wrote a book, Buy the Change You Want to See. This is about the supply chain and creating an ethical and socially constructed supply chain. And it's, um, her company is to the market. And so any company that's a supplier for her um, has been vetted for their ethical practices. Onshill Project, this is who has powered my outfit for today. Um, I love this company. They, it's also the bag that I use on a daily basis. Um, I also have a blanket from them. But 
Like, I don't spend money on anything. I'm not cheap. I'm just fiscally responsible, okay? But if I can take a few extra dollars and support a company that is ethically sourced for its materials and socially conscious, they use artisans in India and provide them with a fair wage and an alternate opportunity um, out of the sex trafficking industry. So if I can spend an extra 20 bucks and not only support land use, but also support environmental equity and change a generational system, I'm going to do that. Learning and growing is at the crux of all of this. So I wanted to highlight a couple of local companies. Kali Glow is um, a researcher out of Eastern Kentucky University, and I know we have some EKU folks in the room. Um, but if you're a nonprofit or with a um, community organization that wants to test the water in the area, Kali Glow provides you with a, an affordable option to do that. Um, at Hickman Creek Conservatory, there was a question about how do we get engaged, how do we know what to do? There are local small nonprofits in every area. Hickman Creek is one of them. Find the area, find the one in your neighborhood that you can support and get engaged in. So these are very local, locally grounded spaces. And then there's also larger, more regional, global folks that have these larger missions but are grounded in innovative and collaborative processes to change how we use our land and what we're doing. Amanda and Larry this morning gave us additional options on apps and tech products that are coming out. So there are options for you to engage and learn more and see it being done differently. Dwayne Depp uses 100% natural soy wax. It's biodegradable. His jars, everything in it is completely sustainable and reusable. I don't know if you have ever questioned soap, especially for women, right? Like the soap in my shower right now is Midnight Stardust. What is that, right? But he has one that's called Misbehaving, and I bought it. So if you ask a good question, it's out there. Because why would you want to know? Why would you not want to know what misbehaving is? I do. Um, Oriental Pearl Co., that's where I got my earrings. But instead of spraying her yard for weeds, she turns them into jewelry, right? What a better way to save the land. Um, I'm all about hugs and snacks. So these are places. Wildcat Willie's is out in Clark County in Winchester. They are a, every company here is locally sourced. Wildcat Willies, their farm also uses regenerative farming practices. So again, about the combination, the intersection of land use. Spark Community Cafe in Woodford County, locally sourced, provides um, access for food insecurity. Um, and then Doodles here in town, all of their accoutrements are um, compostable. My CSA is black, y'all. Is yours? If not, it could be. Or maybe you're not ready. So go to a pop-up market, go to an event, find other ways to, that you can support. So they keep flagging me that I'm over time. Here is my call to action. Um, connect with me. Let's have the conversation. But if you know, I always, if you know me, you know I always end with some kind of superhero reference because, you know, every superhero gets paid to do a day job. I act, my superhero job is actually what I'm getting paid to do. So just save one and then you will know what to do. Evaluate and change one policy. If you aren't involved in policy work, advocate for one change. Use your lenses, use your thinking caps. Buy one more gift or personal item that supports environmental justice and equity in land use. Share one thing, one blog post, one company with a friend or news article. We can do this, we can make the world a better place. We're gonna have to do it scared. We're gonna have to do it sweaty. And when we chase our fears, maybe that's the fear of being vulnerable and admitting you're unsure of how to move forward. Maybe it's the fear of not being able to borrow or share a lens. Maybe it's the fear of not being able to change out your thinking caps. But when we chase our fears, that's when we make space for magic. And again, that magic can be hard. It will take work, but magic is beautiful. Magic brings wonder and hope and dreams. And everyone needs a little magic to make them smile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. I really enjoyed that. And I have really enjoyed getting to meet you, both pre-conference planning and then at our reception last night. I really enjoyed talking with you. And your lived Thank experience you. is wonderful. I have a 15-year-old and a 9-year-old. And empathy is something that I try my best to teach them. And it is trying, especially mm. for the 15-year-old sometimes. But I really, yeah. the message of empathy is very important for all of us. Um, so now it's time for the questions. We have a few questions on the board. And I am like Tristine. It's a little harder for me to read them from here, but I am going to give it my best shot. So the first question for you is, how can we change the thinking of family and friends who 
feel like sustainability is something that they can do, but will help on a large, larger scale. It's yeah. not something that they can do. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that says Christy is your name. Christy, whoever you are, you can come pick your own candle. Pick misbehaving, please, because I want to know what that smells like, and I didn't open it. Um, but start with something like this, right? Sometimes it's easier to donate or to be a postivist instead of an activist, right? We can like, we can share. We like to do things on social media without being engaged in the work, right? When we keep change for ourselves or for others at arm's length, when we stay at a distance, it feels safe, right? This question is grounded in how do we, how do we bend the elbow a little bit, right? How do we bring them in more to do more? And so part of it is about expanding what's, what sustainability means, sharing other options for how to be sustainable or support things that are sustainable. Take them to one of those restaurants. Take them on a farm tour with black soil. App Harvest does tours as well. Show them what it means, right? Take them, let them taste. Locally sourced food tastes different, right? Go to App Harvest and then go to Wildcat Willie's and have a meal there. Help them learn. Help them see that it's easier to engage than they think it might be, and it doesn't have to always be on this grandiose type scale. And I would be remiss if I didn't put a little plug in for a program that, great, that Bluegrass Green Source manages for the city of Lexington called Green Check. Doodles um, and uh, Black Soil are both Green Check members, and that is a program that um, awards sustainability, awards levels for different sustainability uh, practices that they have. So they're all in Lexington because it's um, a partnership with the city of Lexington, but um, I'm Perfect. glad that you are promoting all of those too. Okay, so the next question, I'm going to read from my phone because I'm better at that. Uh, how do you bridge the gap between opposing and differing views and underline the commonalities between people for the sake of the environment and their health? Yeah. It is very appropriate now. Super appropriate, right? Because I think that's what we're all about is how do we help people understand health disparities and health equity, right? And it's, and it's grounded in the lenses. And um, there's a different variation of this of this talk that I do that's um, more grounded in the bias part, right, in understanding why we do that, why we have those emotional or visceral reactions to the conversation. Um, and it's important to stay grounded in everybody's individual story, right, which is why I intentionally take the time to list out all of the different lenses that you could potentially be wearing and not just stay focused on mine or the ones that get talked about the most. So. When we think about bridging the gap, start with the human. Remember the person on the other side. My leading question when I meet you is not like, Amy, how do you feel about health disparities? <laughs> right? Like, Amy, tell me about you. I want to get to know Amy first. You have to invest. Trust is an investment over time. And what you're asking them to do is trust you with their deep and personal thoughts and feelings and emotions. And the only way that they're going to do that is if you take the time to invest in them first. So trust, invest in trust. That's great. Um, next, we're gonna have a, a tiny little break and then we're gonna have students come up. So this is a very appropriate question uh, for, for, the, for the next little bit, um, which is how do you curate an environmental educatory curriculum, <laughs> education curriculum to include a more thinking cap style for students to learn from? Yeah, experience. I love experiential education. I taught in the public schools. Um, for many years, um, and 10 years ago, I was able to put three different community gardens in our school system, two based in the high school, like inside our high school walls in green spaces, and one at the middle school in the, in the county that I was serving in. When there are physical experiential opportunities where students can engage and, in, and learn from, this is when they start to think differently because they have to physically do it. And things that they didn't understand, questions, comments, things that come up that they didn't know, that's when they start learning like, but why and how? But what do you mean I can't? But why can't they? Give them an experience that they can react to and respond to, that's how you will get them to think differently. And this is a very related question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it has to do with empathy specifically, which is how do we help our 15-year-olds and our neighbors and our peers to have more empathy? How do we help them see these things if there's a difference than what you've already said? Listen, I, I also have tiny gremlins, <clears throat> and my daughter is seven, <clears throat> and she is a U.S. attorney trapped in a seven-year-old's body. <laughs> and I shared a meme. Like, I have watched her take down like entire middle school group, group of boys, like, and she'll just redirect the whole energy of the space. 
But I shared a meme this morning that I could, that was like, I can go from like, oh, you're so cute and I love you so much to like, I don't know what you're thinking, but we can go if you're feeling some kind of way about something. Like, we can fight right now. I think it's hardest. Empathy is so much harder with the people we love the most, right? We operate, my family operates on, a, on an open door, open home policy, and the number of people that have come through our home, young people in particular. I served as an interventionist for years um, and spent time in courts and spent time helping my teenagers reacclimate back into the system after having spent time um, in different facilities. Empathy for me was so much easier with them than it is with my own children. It's so much harder when the people who are closest to us say something that upsets us or hurts us because we expect them to know better. We expect them to understand. The expectation is, well, why didn't you know that was going to hurt my feelings? Why didn't you know I needed to hear it differently or understand it differently? We don't carry, we don't apply that same weight to everybody else. So when, we, when we're talking about empathy for our friends and family, separate yourself just a little bit. Why am I having such an aversive reaction to this particular comment? Why am I feeling some kind of way about this particular issue? Before like, I can't believe he just said that, right? Like this is how every fight starts in my home, mostly with my children. <laughs> If we, can, if we can take a step back and really, f and try and communicate, what am I actually upset about? What is the actual problem? What are we actually trying to get accomplished? That will help you shift your lenses a little bit. It will help you hear the information a little bit. It helps soften the why would you do that to more of a, can you say that differently? Help me understand what you're upset about. Can we just take a deep breath and then start again? It will allow us all to have a different conversation, be able to enter the space or reset the space in a very different way. So I would say step back when it comes to family and friends just a little bit. Thank you very much. Uh, my dad, who passed away in 2003, always told me that the downfall of civilization was cat fancy and dog fancy. He said that prior to that, all the dog and cat lovers had to learn about all the pets all together at the same time. And as soon as it got separated, then we started developing these silos. So that was a long time ago, and it still holds true today. Absolutely. Dr. Wright, thank you very, very much for your Absolutely. speech. We have more questions that we didn't get to. Again, we will try and get those um, answered and send them out to you all as uh, attendees in the next week. So thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to take just a quick get up and go to the bathroom break, and we will be back here at 125. Rachel, you texted me that, but is that right? 125? Sorry. Yes, 125. We will be back up here at 125 and start the sort of afternoon session. Thank you.